Hello everybody. Today we're thinking about gas exchange in plants and in particular about how the balance of respiration and photosynthesis shifts during the 24 hour period, shifts because of light intensity. Let's start off by having a look at a little bit of leaf anatomy. This shot here is of the underside of a leaf, of the lower epidermis of the leaf. You can see guard cells here, well, just general epidermal cells around here, uh, subsidiary cells as they're called here, and then guard cells here, these kind of balloon-like cells on the underside of a plant. This stoma in the middle, plural stomata, singular stoma, is just a gap into the leaf. And the way that these guard cells work is that they have a uh, reinforced cellulose edge along here, more cellulose along this edge than on the other edge, and therefore when they expand, this edge expands less than this edge here. So as it expands, it stretches, opening up this hole. Now, it is through that hole that gas exchange will occur in the leaf of a plant. This is a cross-section of one such leaf, and we can see down here our lower epidermis, guard cells, and the stoma here. Gas exchange is extremely important. Plants need to get hold of carbon dioxide, which is an extremely rare gas in the atmosphere from the point of view of a plant. They need that carbon dioxide as a raw material for photosynthesis. And it's always worth being able to rattle off in your mind the equation for photosynthesis. It is, of course, 6CO2 plus 6H2O goes to C6H12O6 plus 6O2. That is worth just having at the tip of your tongue all the time. Gas exchange works because our palisade mesophyll cells here, which are packed full of chloroplasts, as it shows here, are nicely stacked, but also have little gaps there. And then we have this spongy mesophyll here with air spaces between the cells themselves. And so carbon dioxide can diffuse in from the atmosphere all the way through to here. And there is another video looking at the structure of leaves. Give it a go. Not only do plants need to get hold of CO2 for photosynthesis, but the O2 that they produce needs to leave, and that will diffuse out through uh, this stoma here. This is all by diffusion, so it's all on concentration gradients, as the palisade mesophyll cells use CO2 in photosynthesis, uh, as the uh, chloroplasts use that up. So the concentration of carbon dioxide will become lower uh, in this, uh, where's my pen gone? There it is. It will become lower in this region of the leaf, and so carbon dioxide will diffuse in, down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. Well, that's all very well during the day, but what about night time? Uh, let's kill the lights. Did you see that? Wow. And what will happen? Well, photosynthesis will not continue at night time. It won't even continue at a low rate, it just won't continue. And so, our low concentration of CO2 will no longer be here in the palisade mesophyll cells. They will stop using it up and so we will no longer have that concentration gradient. Additionally, we should be aware, of course, that all the time, be it by day or by night, respiration will be continuing and that will be producing carbon dioxide just as it produces carbon dioxide in animals or fungi or any other organism. So therefore we have a reversal of our concentration gradients. Carbon dioxide is going to be produced by all the cells of the leaf, as it is all the time, but it's going to be produced at a faster rate than it is taken up by photosynthesis, because of course there is no longer any take up due to photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide will now be diffusing out of the leaf. Out, there we go. By the same token, oxygen, whereas previously the leaf was producing more oxygen than it was releasing, is now going to be producing no oxygen and only taking oxygen in. So we're going to have a a uh, higher concentration of oxygen out here than we do in here, because here the concentration of oxygen will be a little lower. Let's have a look at that on a graph. Let us say that this is the rate of respiration. We take it as being a flat rate. Uh, regardless of the light intensity, the rate of respiration isn't going to change. If you look at our y-axis label here, this is the relative rate of CO2 release or uptake. For respiration, we're talking about carbon dioxide release, and that doesn't change according to light intensity. Now let's put the line for photosynthesis onto this graph. You can see that uh, at low light intensities there is no photosynthesis, and then as we start to get enough light to photosynthesize, so its rate climbs up this way. And it keeps on climbing and climbing and climbing. At light intensities 
lower than this point here, we have overall CO2 production. Whereas everything on this side of this dividing line that we've popped up here, we're going to have CO2 uptake. And this point here, where the two lines cross, we call that the compensation point. There is no overall CO2 production or uptake. So if you like, you can think of respiration balancing photosynthesis. Of course, it's balancing photosynthesis in two other ways as well. It's balancing photosynthesis in O2 production and uptake. So respiration is using O2 at the same rate as photosynthesis is producing O2. Likewise, also the sugars that each of them uh, involve. Respiration at this point is going to be using those sugars, such as glucose, at the same rate as photosynthesis is making those sugars, um, such as glucose. This is a nice little experiment to demonstrate the CO2 production. Uh, our technicians set this up for us and we're very grateful for it. We've got in these boiling tubes a sample of pondweed called elodea. I'll just write elodea over here. My handwriting is normally better than this uh, with an all ink and pen. I should just put that disclaimer out there now. This is our starting point. We've got elodea in two tubes and we've got two empty tubes here. In each of the four of these tubes we have something called hydrogen carbonate indicator. That's going to be on a table later on uh, in this video. Hydrogen carbonate indicator changes colour according to the concentration of carbon dioxide in the solution. Now we're starting off with an approximately atmospheric concentration of CO2 in each of these four boiling tubes and the colour is this nice orange colour. That you can take as being normal or medium or atmospheric concentrations of CO2. Well, we're now going to wrap some up in foil. This, of course, will shut off the light. This is our elodea here. and There is elodea in this boiling tube here, but it's all wrapped up in foil with the result that it is absolutely dark in there. These two don't contain elodea. These are our negative controls. They have no living organism in there. We're just setting them up in this way to show that light itself is not the cause of any change that we come to see. And now let's have a look at them 24 hours later. We left these tubes for 24 hours. Let's have a look. OK, well, we've got the foil removed from them and they've come out. Uh, I, I like this experiment. You get, you get quite a lot of nice pretty colours out of it. But there you go. This elodea has turned its indicator purple. This elodea has turned it yellow. And we're very pleased to see that these uh, uh, negative controls have shown no change from the original. Why has this gone purple? Why has this gone yellow? Well, purple indicates that there is a lower than atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And yellow indicates that there is a higher than atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And let's just check we understand why. Photosynthesis has been going on at a greater rate than respiration. Therefore, CO2 taken in by the elodea is greater than CO2 released out by the elodea. So therefore, this, the solution, has a lower concentration of carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide has been removed by elodea. However, in this sample over here, photosynthesis equals zero because it's been in the dark. Therefore, photosynthesis is smaller than the rate of respiration. CO2 taken in by the plant is much smaller than CO2 released by the plant, released out by the plant. Therefore, as this plant is giving out CO2 overall, the CO2 concentration rises in this boiling tube, whereas in this case, the CO2 enters the plant and is taken up. I hope that makes sense. Here's a little summary table to uh, help us remember the colour changes. You do need to remember these colour changes for GCSE. You will need to be able to manipulate them in questions as well. Furthermore, I've got this little cheeky question for you to ponder. If we were to have a boiling tube in direct sunlight with this hydrogen carbonate indicator, pondweed, and a small aquatic snail, what colour would we expect after 24 hours? Well, why don't you have a crack at that uh, and see how you do? Thanks very much, and I hope that helps.